Scripture this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility. Regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of given to Jesus, every knee should bend. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, shining as lights in the world. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And here ends the reading. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, be our guest. Open our minds, our hearts, our souls to the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You remember in the bad old days of the pandemic when you couldn't go outside unless you wore a mask and you had to figure out some new way of entertaining yourselves? Did you develop any habits or routines or practices then that you're still doing now? Well, I did. Every time, every day at lunch, when my wife was working in the other room, online of course, and I was left to my own devices, I would make something for myself to eat, and I would sit down at a table, and I would open up my iPad and browse YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I still do it. You know, it is amazing how YouTube can figure out what it is that you should watch. <laughs> Somehow, it figured out that I enjoy playing the guitar. And so, up comes this free blues lesson. 
Somehow it figured out what news people I like to watch, and up came a summary of last night's news, without the commercials, of course. And it really taught me, you know, there's really not a whole lot of news that you can get by with without commercials. Or you could even, I, I started listening to David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart and others that would come on with David Brooks with Judy Woodruff on NPR and they would summarize and analyze in a very helpful way and give a couple of ways of looking at the events of the last week. It was just amazing. And I was hooked, particularly by a series that was entitled, What Life Was Like As. They knew of my, YouTube knew of my interest in history, I guess, so I could go on YouTube and find out what life was like as a Viking. Or a Spartan. Or a slave in Egypt. Or an enslaved person in Rome. It was like traveling back in time and then being able to comfortably come back into my own. But one thing I was particularly taken by was a YouTube in that series that told me what life was like as a soldier in the Roman Legion. Now, for the life of me, I could not find a YouTube video that told me what life was like as a Christ follower in the ancient city of Philippi. Well, we don't have a video of that, but we do have a letter. The letter begins like this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no return address, but the destination is very clear. The ancient city of Philippi. Now, if I had been a soldier in a Roman legion and I had survived the imperial wars, the forever wars, perhaps, and if I had managed to complete a term of service of 25 years, I could take my place in a retirement community in the city of Philippi. In that city, there was a, the center of an imperial cult. That is, a cult that celebrated and worshipped the hierarchy that was present in that society with the emperor on top, and then below the emperor there were those citizens of Rome, wealthy, privileged, powerful, a hierarchy that was tightly organized and rigidly enforced, where above them all, the emperor was worshipped as a god. Now, if I had been a soldier in the Roman legion, I would have been a venerated presence in the city of Philippi. I would, be, I would feel very much at home. I would be an honored guest in any, play, in any public place because I had risked my life to preserve the Roman way of life. You might say I had risked my life for the gospel of Rome, the good news that Caesar and his legions had brought peace and prosperity and law and order for the privileged who were called themselves Roman citizens. The center of that gospel was 
Caesar, who was known or called a son of God. And in many at many times he was addressed as Lord and Savior. Because it was because of Caesar, order had been brought out of chaos and peace was preserved. Now, meanwhile, somewhere in the bowels of that empire sat a less than honorable citizen of Rome whose name was Paul. He was imprisoned for his service not to the imperial Lord, but to one that he called Lord, Christ Jesus. He was imprisoned because he was promoting a society that turned everything upside down. It was called koinonia, which we know for the word for fellowship. Later on, koinonia and fellowship would be known as the church. The way of life that, was, that Paul was preaching was patterned after the Lord Jesus Christ, not the laws of Caesar. Koinonia was a place where there was no hierarchy, at least the hierarchy that was known in Rome, because in the eyes of God, at the heart of Paul's gospel, was there was no difference between rich or poor. There was no difference between male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. It was an alternative vision of how human life ought to be. It was an alternative vision of society. And in Philippi, that was one of the places where that vision had taken root. In Paul's, we'll call it sanctified imagination, and in his heart and the depths of his soul, he imagined a community that was patterning its life around a son of God, not called Caesar. A son of God, not like Caesar, that rose up from an elite family through the ranks of the military in order to become divine. This was a son of God that in the beginning was in the form of God, but then was made into human likeness like ourselves, humbling himself to the point where he died on a Roman cross. Now when that little group in Philippi heard this gospel of this downwardly mobile Christ, they took it to heart. Now in Jesus' name, they were blessing the poor, healing the sick, not ignoring them. Now, a community that patterns its life like that is blessed. But sometimes even the blessed community can, the bonds that bind them can be stressed and maybe even broken. And Paul has heard from his imprisonment in a Roman dungeon that they are in trouble. There, there's no video available, but we can peek through the lines of this letter and find out a little bit more about what was going on in the community at Philippi. There were two prominent leaders in the community. You might call it they were across a partisan divide. And there were followers of each of the leaders. And the community was becoming divided and contentious. Moreover, 
there was a group that had come from the outside and it said the reason why you're having such trouble is that Paul, who preached this gospel to you, is not qualified to preach in the name of Jesus, for he didn't know him in the flesh. Everybody knows that there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek. Some were preaching that you had to become Jewish in order to become Christian. That Israel was more favored than the Gentiles. Paul was preaching that boundaries like that were broken in this community of faith. But, even though there was this bad church stuff going on in that community of Philippi, Paul knew that the same mind that was in Christ Jesus was still in them. Someone was reaching across a partisan divide to offer encouragement to somebody else. Someone was consoling someone else in love, even though they had their differences. Sometimes a spirit of compassion took over from the spirit of rancor and division, and people were offering sympathy and solidarity to each other. They were practicing virtues that were in short supply in that society, compassion, empathy, sharing, love. So when this letter arrived in the Philippian community and was read aloud, they must have said, aha, that's like us. He knows us. They recognize themselves like we can recognize ourselves when we read this. Oh, we know what it's like to be in trouble. We know what it's like to be under stress. We know what it's like to be suffering from partisan divides and rancor. And frankly, the problems that the Philippians were, were encountering pale in comparison to some of the things that we are suffering. Do I even need to name them for you? When we're under that kind of pressure that comes from within and without, we're tempted to withdraw and turn away from our compassion and attention to others and attend only to ourselves. Pressures like those that we are under as the Christian church in our day threaten to break us. Now, we do know that Paul had received a letter from the people in Philippi, but that letter doesn't exist any longer, it's lost. But I think we can imagine what might have been in such a letter? Dear Paul, we are praying for you in your imprisonment. We're grateful for your work among us, but we feel broken. You talk about living a life worthy of the gospel. We are feeling the pressure of living that kind of life in our kind of world. It's just too strong. Self-interest, pride, corruption, it's just too hard, Paul. We need your help. And I think what Paul said in the letter that was read earlier indicates that perhaps they might have been startled by what he said. When he said, my beloved, you're going to have to work out your salvation even with fear and trembling. As, as if to say, I'm not able to come now, I'm not able to rescue you 
But rest assured, the mind of Christ is in you. You have all that you need to live a life worthy of the gospel. You might be feeling broken right now, dear ones, but I assure you, you are blessed. So go ahead, make my joy complete. Come together and be koinonia. Be the church. So I, I think if Paul knew us, and maybe in the communion of saints, maybe Paul does. But I think if he knew us and some of the things that we struggle with by being the body of Christ in a world like ours, he would say something like this to us. You are going to have to work out what it means to be a faithful witness. You're going to have to work out as a church what it means by living a life together that is worthy of the gospel. No consultant, no pastor, no politician, no conference minister, nobody from the national church can do it for you. But listen, you're ready for this. You're all grown up now. You are mature as a church. You have what it takes because you have within you the mind of Christ. Now, that's what Paul might have said to us. But listen to what one of our own spiritual leaders has to say to the church at large. Stephen Charleston is a retired bishop in the Episcopal Church. He's a former theologian from the Luther School of Theology in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he is a leader in the Choctaw Nation. He put it this way. Now is the moment for which a lifetime of faith has prepared you. It has given you the tools you need to respond, to proclaim justice while standing for peace. Long ago, the Spirit called you to commit your life to faith. And now you know why. You are a source of strength for those who have lost hope. You are a voice of calm in the midst of chaos. You are a steady light in the midst of darkness. The time has come for you to be what you believe. My brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ here at Wheat Ridge, our time has come to be what we believe. May it be so. Amen.